God is amazing. He continues to marvel me. And I pray that I never come to a point where that ceases to take place. Because the totality of all that God is, it's incomprehensible to the human mind. And we should continually be amazed by Him. If we're continuing to walk with Him, we should continue to be overwhelmed at His presence, being with us always, His power, His authority, man, His, his goodness, the, the tender touches of His love. Don't you find it amazing that when you believe you can't go any further, that you are so beyond anybody's reach, the Heavenly Father, He just reaches down as only He can. And He touches your heart. And His love just overwhelms our soul. He gives us energy. He gives us strength to, to continue on. He's amazing. He's an awesome God. He's worthy of all that we are. All that we ever will be. He's worthy of our complete love, adoration. The remainder of our lives, He is worthy of that. And so much more. What an honor and privilege it is know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. To be able to come together and worship Him, man, it's a freedom that so many don't have and a privilege that so many don't have. We have that freedom. We have that privilege. And it's been good to be here and worship through song. We're going to continue our worship of God as we jump into His Word. We're looking at a, a series of messages that uh, go under the, the title of Living the Dream. And we've been looking at uh, Joseph's life, how God has given him a dream and how God has brought about uh, the fulfillment of this dream. Not, not because of Joseph, but in, in a lot of ways in spite of Joseph. And uh, last week we were looking at what a difference a day can make. One day, uh, Joseph, he went from the, pa uh, the, the prison to the palace. He went from being nobody to being second in command in the most powerful nation of his day. I mean, just in one day. And, and, and we discussed the reality of what a difference a day can make with the Lord working and moving. I mean, when you think there's no light at the end of the tunnel, God can totally turn everything upside down in one single day. We need to live in light of that. Knowing that our God is able and that He does what he wants to do. And there are no boundaries that restrict him. God can do and he can turn things around. He can bring us to where he wants us to be. He can fix anything in a matter of one day. Today we're going to transition a little bit and think about mercy. Mercy. Joseph, he takes his position in Egypt. Things unfold as the Lord has foretold. Remember, He gave Pharaoh two dreams. They were really the same dream, but God was confirming the, the dream that He had given Pharaoh that, in fact, in the known world, there was going to be seven years of abundance. Plenty. That was going to be followed up by seven years of famine. And the famine was going to be so harsh that the, the seven years of Production and prosperity would be forgotten. Joseph's put in position as, as a wise guide in the land of Egypt in which during the seven years of plenty that comes about, they are collecting one-fifth of everything that is produced. And, and Scripture says that there is, there is so much that they have in reserve it can't even be counted. Just as God says, after the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine begin. The land begins to be in need. Not only the land of Egypt, but the surrounding areas, including the land of Canaan. Now this is where Joseph's family is. They begin to be in need. And they begin to hear that there is grain in Egypt. 
So Jacob, Joseph's dad, he tells the rest of his sons to go to Egypt to buy grain for them so that they will not starve to death. And he sends all of his sons except Benjamin, Joseph's brother, to Egypt to buy grain. His brothers come in, Joseph's brothers come in, and he recognizes them. And he's kind of stern with them. And uh, he begins to accuse them of being spies. He says, you've come into the land to spy out the land to see our weaknesses. And he begins to question them who they are, where they come from, uh, who their, their, their family is, do they have a father, do they have brothers. And they begin to uh, express to Joseph where they come from, that they are all the sons of, of one, one father, that there was a brother that's no more speaking of Joseph, and there's still one brother that's back at home. And, and he, he tells his brothers, he says, look, this is how you're going to prove that you're not spies. You're going to go back, I'm going to keep one of you, and you're going to go back, and you're going to get this other brother you're talking about, which is Joseph's brother, and you're going to bring him back to this land. And you will not see my face again until you bring him. So all of Joseph's brothers, except one that stays in Egypt, they go back to Jacob, the rest of the family, carry grain. They tell Jacob the, the events that unfolded. They said that the, the, the ruler, the leader in Egypt, he's a harsh man. And he, he questioned us personally, and we began to tell him our story. And we told him about Benjamin which is the brother that was held back. And he said that we're not to come back into the land unless we bring him. Jacob says, look, you're never carrying Benjamin. <laughs> He's my favorite son. Joseph's no more. Benjamin's all I got. You're not taking him. Time passes. The grain that they had carried back to Canaan, it is eaten up. They begin to be in need. Isn't it amazing how God uses our need to get us to do things that we probably would never have done. They begin to be in need again. Jacob says to his sons, go back to the land. Buy some more grain. And they say, no. No, we're not going back unless we can carry Benjamin. I'm sure Jacob resisted that. He didn't want his son that he loved to go to Egypt. But finally, they began to be in such need that he says, look, take Benjamin. If something happens to him, uh, I'll just have to be bereaved. I'll have to be hurt. Take him. Go get some grain. So they go back to Egypt again. They carry Benjamin. And the events unfold in which uh, Joseph is, is trying to get his brother's attention. He's trying to get them to see uh, their wrongdoing in the past as God does with us. And it comes to a climactic point in Genesis 45, beginning in verse 1, in which uh, Joseph is fixing to reveal himself to his brothers. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence? So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. 
But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to, uh, to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Verse 9. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph said. God has made me lord in all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. And then events unfold. Joseph's family moves to the land of Egypt. And time passes and, and Jacob, their father, he comes to the end of his life. Turn over to Genesis chapter 50. Let's look at verse 15 through 21 real quick. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to come. And uh, Lord, I just want to praise you, exalt you. God, there is none like you. You are the authority over all authorities. You are the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are the living God who sits upon your throne over all things. God, what an awesome, awesome privilege it is to know you and be known by you. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us the awesome privilege of salvation. God, we know that if you had not uh, reached out, if you had not provided a way, there would be no way. God, we thank you so much that through the blood of Jesus, we can be called children of God. And I thank you, dear God, that as you begin a work within us, it's you who carry it to completion. And Father, I pray for each one of us, God, that we would have willing spirits. God, that we would be willing to continue to die to self and live more and more unto you. God, help us to decrease and you increase within our lives. And Father, I pray that as you continue the growth and maturity in each one of us, Father, I pray that Jesus would be lifted up, that He would be proclaimed, that the gospel would go forth, You would continue to build Your kingdom with those who are being saved. And I pray that all the world would give You the honor, the glory, and the praise. For You alone are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Father, as we look at this message, mercy. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would shine light into the dark places. And Father, as you do, may we be compelled by your love to continue the steps of faith that you set before us individually and collectively as your people. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hosea 6.6 6 says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus, He quotes this scripture. But go and learn from what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not, called, called, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners 
Jesus came to call sinners. It's the sick that need a doctor, not those who do not recognize their sickness. Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. James 2, 12 through 13, it says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy trumps judgment. Mercy. Some people get mercy and grace confused. But they're different. Grace is to receive what I do not deserve. Mercy is to not get what I do deserve. Let me repeat that. Grace is to get what I do not deserve. Mercy is to not get what I do deserve. We do not want what we deserve. We need what we do not deserve. We need grace. We need mercy. And once we come to know mercy and we come to understand grace, God calls us, each one of us, to share. To share what we have received. To share grace. To share mercy. One of the things I want us to see in this passage that we read, these two passages this morning, is that tables turn. Tables turn. You remember there was a time when Joseph was 17? He was his dad's favorite, and his dad gave him an ornamented robe, and, and Joseph was a little proud, he was a little conceited, and, and his brothers, they became envious of him. And they resented him. And there came a day in which his brothers had an opportunity. They had an opportunity either to show mercy or to bring forth judgment. They were envious of Joseph. And you remember the story. We've already worked through it. They saw Joseph coming and they ended up selling him into slavery. They talked about killing him. They talked about ending his life, but God's sovereign control kept them from doing that. And they sold him into slavery. They had an opportunity to do with Joseph what they wanted to do with him. They chose to sell him into slavery. Thirteen years pass. And the tables have turned. Joseph now is the second most powerful man in all the known world. And his brothers are there before him. And he has a decision to make. Judgment or mercy. Tables turn. If you don't believe it, you just live long enough and you'll see. Tables turn. It's not always easy to make the right choice. Sometimes we want people to have what they deserve. But then, one day we're going to stand before God. And we will not want what we deserve. We will want mercy. And if we receive mercy here and now, God calls us to extend mercy to those that we share life with. Tables turn. Sometimes you're the one making the decision. Sometimes you're the one at the mercy of someone making the decision. It may be in a workplace. It may be in a family environment. It may be among God's people. But one thing you need to be cognizant of is you continue to travel down this road of faith, believing God, trusting God. Listen, tables... Tables turn. 
one day we're all going to give an account. God places us in positions and He entrusts responsibilities and stewardships unto each one of us. And God expects those who have received mercy to show mercy. To extend mercy. And I tell you what, when I remember my need, and I remember who I am, and I remember one day I'm going to breathe my last breath here on this earth. And I'm going to stand before a holy and righteous God. It becomes a little bit easier to be merciful. To not give people what they deserve. But instead, withhold. Here in this text, we see Joseph. He is, he is in control. He, he has authority over his brothers. His brothers deserve to be in prison for the rest of their life at a minimum. And at the maximum, they deserve their lives to be taken. Yet, Joseph shows mercy. He doesn't give his brothers what they deserve. Tables turn. Live every day of your life being mindful that tables, they turn. Secondly, I want us to share from the Scripture a few keys to being merciful. A few keys that we find here in this text to be merciful. The first one is this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. You know, Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means me. When we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to understand that Christ's righteousness is placed in our account. But we still live in these bodies of flesh. First John says that if we claim to be without sin, we are liars in the truth, not in us. We need to understand that we have an ongoing, constant need of Almighty God within our life. We are so dependent upon the Spirit of God and the ongoing grace and mercy of God. If God removes His hand from any person at any time, any of us will fall like a rock off a mountaintop. We must remember who we are. We do not stand in our own ability and our own strength. It's not our own power that holds us up. It is the power of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, and if that's ever removed, we all fall. We can look at anyone around us and we can state with confidence, if not for the grace and mercy of God, there I would be. We need to remember who we are. If you're going to let mercy ooze from your life as God desires for mercy to ooze from our life into lives around us, you must remember who you are. Don't you ever forget. If God places you somewhere, you're there by His mercy, not because you deserve it. Remember who you are. It is a key to being merciful. Second. God's grace is the, is the one thing that places us wherever we are. God's grace. Joseph says that he is in the position he's in because of God. Who gave Joseph his vision, his dream? God did. Who brought it about? So anything that, that we are, it's because of God. We don't find ourselves in any position that we, we have earned or deserved. Now I know that's hard for us to fathom in our culture. Because our culture teaches us that, that we are to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We are, to, we are to fight and we are to earn places of position. Do you understand you don't even have the intellect to achieve things without God. 
Anything that we are, it's because of God. Any skill set, any place of power or position or authority or whatever, it's only because of God. And we need to remember that. We need to never forget that. We are wherever we are. As a dad, as a mom, as a boss, as a, a person in position and community among God's people, we are only where we are because of God. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. It's, it's easy. Once God works in our life and moves in our life and he, he puts us in places for His kingdom's work and for His honor and glory, it's real easy to start thinking that I'm there because of me. No, I'm not. The dream's given by God. And it's God who places us wherever we end up. <coughs> Remember who you are. Remember that wherever you are, it's because of God. Third key. Focus on the big picture. God is sovereignly in control. Focus on the big picture. You know, firemen say that there's one thing that will get you killed in a fire. If you become tunnel vision, you'll die. If you get so focused on what you're doing, your little surroundings, and you forget that the whole house is on fire or the whole building's on fire, you will die. Same is true in this spiritual walk with the Lord. If you get focused on your little world, if you think that it's all about what you can see and feel and, and those tangible things that you're so focused on, listen, you will cease to be merciful. You've got to stay focused on the big picture. Listen, this life is about God, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about those who came before us, it's not about those who are coming after us, it's about God. It's about His kingdom's work, it's about His purpose, His plan, it's about Him being exalted, it's about Him being glorified. Listen, everything is created by Him and for Him. For us to be merciful, we must stay focused on the big picture. In other words, keep our eyes off ourselves, keep our eyes off of the circumstances around us, keep our eyes off of one another, and keep our eyes on Him. Notice Joseph, time and time again, he, he shares this focus that he has as he shares mercy with his brothers. Chapter 45, verse 5, it says, God, he says, God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you. Verse 7 of chapter 45. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8 of this chapter. It says, So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Wow. Chapter 50. Verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. There's a big picture going on all the time. And we certainly have our place according to the dreams that God's given each one of us individually. But listen, it's never about me. It's about Him. I promise you, if Joseph would have focused on what his brothers had done, if he would have focused on his power and position, he would not have been merciful. But he knew there was a bigger picture. What his brothers had carried out, listen, it was only under the sovereignty of God. 
And it was all for the kingdom of God. You can tell when you lose focus. Because you stop being merciful. You start acting and responding according to how you feel and what you think rather than the Word of God. You start making things personal in life when it's not personal. Ephesians 6 says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities of darkness. It's a spiritual work that God's doing in all of our lives, all the time. And guess what? God is sovereignly in control. People may have wrong intentions, but listen, God's in control of that too. Man, when we're focused on the big picture, it is a key to being merciful. Remember who you are. Remember why you are wherever you are. It's because of God, not because of you, not because of me, it's because of Him. Stay focused on the big picture. Man, if you get out of focus, and you can tell because you stop being merciful, get back focus. Realize it's not about just right here, right now. God doing something so much bigger than you can even imagine. Other people aren't in control. He is. God's in control. These are keys to being merciful. Tables turn. There's some keys to being merciful which God calls us each to be. There are some results that come from mercy. Result number one, chapter 45, verse 7, lives are saved. You know why Jesus came? He came to seek and to save the lost. Lives are saved when His people are merciful. When we extend mercy, lives are saved. And friend, I want you to understand that's what the church is all about. It's all about lives being saved. It's not about being right. It's not about finding myself a nice, comfortable place. It's not about me being lifted up and becoming perfect in the eyes of me or others. The church is about lives being saved. It's about a kingdom work that God is carrying forth and it's an eternal work. And I want you to understand that one of the results of being merciful Lives are saved. Another result, relationships are mended. Notice if you would that, that Joseph says to his brothers in chapter 45, come close to me. He tells them, look, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go tell my father. Go tell my father that I've been raised up. Listen, this, the, these relationships that had been strained... Joseph shows mercy, and you know what happens? They're mended. You know, there's families that are separated, just like the Hatfields and McCoys. And you know what's keeping it, them families apart? Unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. Let me tell you something greater than all of those. One person would be merciful. I'm telling you, God restores relationships when mercy is extended. You need to understand that He restored our relationship because mercy was extended. Relationships are mended. They're restored. God's provisions for life continue when mercy is extended. Notice if you would there in chapter 50, verse 21. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Listen, the ongoing provision for God's people, it came about because of mercy. 
because Joseph was merciful. He offered his father and his people a place of refuge and promised to continue to provide for them. The provision came through mercy. God's ongoing provision for our life comes through mercy. God never owes any of us. Yet He provides for all of us. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. It comes through mercy. God's mercy. Listen, there's provision needed by people around us that it will come through us, you and I, God's will is done. It's a result of mercy. God's will is done. You know what our soul desire should be for God's will to be done. And it's part of the model prayer. Our Father which art in heaven. God will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know how God's will is done among mankind? It's through mercy. Not giving others what they deserve. Listen, mercy is something God desires over. It trumps judgment. God's will is accomplished in other people's lives as His people are merciful. God is glorified. It's a result of mercy. God is glorified. He's exalted. And dreams. Dreams are lived out in other people's lives as we continue to extend mercy. You know the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Man, that's called mercy. And there's all kinds of positive results that come from mercy. So who's to be merciful? Those who receive mercy. That's it. Who needs mercy? Everybody. Everybody. There, there's no hope without mercy. There's no hope for anyone. But through mercy, God's mercy, and His grace, listen, there's hope. You know, there's a lot of people there, they can't display mercy because they've never received mercy. You can't give something that you don't have. If you've not received mercy from God, you can't be merciful. Listen, God extends mercy. I don't care who you are. I don't care your background. I, I don't care what you've done. God's mercy is greater. And listen, He desires to give mercy rather than judgment. It's not God's desire to judge. But friend, He will. For anyone who will not receive His mercy, there will be judgment. And He beckons each one to come. And receive His grace and mercy through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And He offers it to all people. Listen, you've got to receive before you can give. You need to understand that God doesn't want to judge anybody. He wants to be merciful. He wants to forgive. He wants to cleanse. He wants to adopt each one into His family. But you've got to receive. You need to ask. Listen, God's not going to force His mercy upon anybody. He just offers it. He says, come. Come. And I'll give you mercy. I will give you grace. And if you're here, maybe you're on the video and you've not received mercy, you can't expect to give mercy. And listen, God wants to be merciful to you. But you've got to open up your heart and you've got to let Him. For those who've received mercy, you know what God expects? He expects us to be merciful. You need to be aware of something. Tables are going to turn. So 
It's all about life. Tables turn. There's some keys to being merciful. And there's great result from it. And God calls each one of us as His children to be merciful. Mercy trumps judgment. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 18 about a king who has a couple of people that owe him a little bit of something. One more than others. The one that owes him the most comes unto him and says, please be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. I can't pay right now. Be merciful to me. And the king shows him mercy. And this man goes out and someone owes him something. And his debtor cries out for mercy, but he doesn't give mercy. He throws the man in prison until he can pay the last sin he owes. And the king comes back to him and he says, You wicked servant! How could you not be merciful after I was so merciful to you? Take him and lock him up until he can pay every last sin. Man, the debt we owe God, it's more than anything anybody will ever owe us. And if He has been merciful to us, we are to go. Be merciful.